Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Ed Excel International A-Level Chemistry Unit 4 for June 2022. This is the part 2 video. I'll put the link of the part 1 and part 3 video below the description box. Let us begin with the first question. Question 16 says this question is about ammonia and ammonium chloride. Ammonia is produced by reacting nitrogen and hydrogen as shown below. That is the equation for the reaction. And then they say it, write the expression for the equilibrium constant Kp. Kp should be the partial pressures of the products over the partial pressures of the reactants. So in this case, we have ammonia. So we will get the partial pressure of ammonia power the coefficient of ammonia and put it above here. And then we'll get the multiple of these two. So the partial pressure of nitrogen power one times the partial pressure of hydrogen to the power of the coefficient, which is three. Here they say an equilibrium was established by mixing nitrogen and hydrogen in a ratio of 1 3 by volume so they say at a temperature of 450 degrees celsius and a pressure of 200 atmospheres the equilibrium mixture contained 28 percent of ammonia by volume they want you to complete the table so here i will write the equation and i wrote the ratios in which these are going to be mixed so the ratio is 1 to 3 and at the end they told us the equilibrium mixture contained 28 percent of ammonia that is the fraction of ammonia present so here in the table, they give us the fraction of ammonia, which is again 0.28. If the fraction of ammonia is 0.28, the remaining should be that of nitrogen and hydrogen at equilibrium. So I wanted to find that value. So it should be 1 minus 0.28, which gives me 0.72. Of this 0.72, we can find what corresponds to the nitrogen and what corresponds to hydrogen. So to do that, since I knew the ratio is going to be 1 to 3, so I say 1 divided by 4 times that which is 0.72 and I get 0.18 and 3 over 4 times 0.72 this gives us 0.54 and that is what I get. Now when we went to the part of the partial pressure remember to find partial pressure we need to multiply total pressure times the mole fraction. So to get the partial pressure of ammonia it will be the mole fraction of ammonia times the total pressure which is 200 as you saw here we get 56. The partial pressure of hydrogen should be the mole fraction of hydrogen times the total pressure which gives us that and the partial pressure of nitrogen should be the mole fraction of nitrogen times the total pressure, which gave us that. So that is what I filled in the table. Next, I say calculate the equilibrium constant and give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures and include units if required. Remember, I already wrote this expression here, so all I had to do is to put in the partial pressures. So since this is 56, you put it there and square. This one here is 36. There is no power there and then multiply with the partial pressure of hydrogen to the power 3. Feed everything in your calculator. I wrote my answer to two significant figures, which is 6.9 times 10 power negative 5 atmosphere power negative 2. Remember, this is part atmosphere. Since the units, this is going to be atmosphere squared, and down here we'll have atmosphere power 4. So the squared uh, cancels out with one part here. Then we remain with per atmosphere squared. That is the unit we get here. Moving on, here they say when the temperature was reduced to 400, remember initially it was for 50, so it was reduced to 400. At the same pressure, the equilibrium mixture contained 36% ammonia. Remember, this is going to be more. Previously, it was 28%. Let me take you back here. It was 28%. So if it increases to 36%, it means something has occurred. As this temperature has been decreased, that has caused an effect. So equilibrium has shifted to one side. So they say explain what can be deduced about this reaction from this information. So let us go back to the equation here. From this equation here, we can see if you decrease the temperature and then you produce more ammonia, it means decreasing the temperature has caused equilibrium to go to the product side. And that would have meant that the forward reaction is going to be an exothermic reaction since when you decrease the temperature, it led to a higher yield of the product. So back here, I say the forward reaction is exothermic because a decrease in temperature from 450 to 400 shifted equilibrium to the right side, leading to a high yield of ammonia. So we can know that this is going to be an exothermic reaction in the forward direction. Moving on. Here they say ammonium chloride can be produced by reacting ammonia with hydrogen chloride. I wrote part of that reaction. So they say ammonium chloride is a white solid that is very soluble in water. Hess law can be used to calculate the enthalpy of solution of ammonium chloride using hydration enthalpies and lattice energy. They want you to complete the Hess cycle by filling the empty box. Remember this reaction is about producing ammonium chloride and we can see this is the lattice energy for that reaction. 
However, since they are using enthalpies of solution and enthalpies of hydration, it means gaseous ions being surrounded by water in order to produce aqueous ions. So they should be ammonium aqueous plus chloride aqueous. As water molecules surround those gaseous ions, they are going to be converted into aqueous ions. So that should be your answer right there. And then part two, they say complete the expression for the enthalpy change of solution using the hydration enthalpies and lattice energy. From this, I know that in order to find this, I'm going to go that and go that way. So this should be the negative of lattice energy plus hydration energy. Or you could say it's going to be hydration energy minus the lattice energy. So writing it like that scores you one mark, as you see there. Calculate the enthalpy change of solution using your expression in B2 and these data. So we have this data here. Remember, for the hydration enthalpy, each of the ions is going to be hydrated separately. So we should have the hydration enthalpy for ammonium and the hydration enthalpy of chloride. So from the information given here, hydration enthalpy of ammonium is put there and the hydration enthalpy of chloride is put there as part of the enthalpy of hydration. And then we subtract the lattice energy, which is given. Sum everything up. We got positive 20 kilojoules per mole. And that is the answer here. Let's continue. The next part says that a student suggested that the enthalpy change of solution of ammonium bromide would be of a similar magnitude to the enthalpy change of solution of ammonium chloride. Comment on this suggestion in terms of hydration enthalpies and lattice enthalpies of the two. So let's see here we are looking at ammonium bromide and ammonium chloride so we can see that the cations are exactly the same which is ammonium so the difference is going to be caused by the anions. So I said the halides are bonded to the same cation, but the anions are different in size. We know bromide is going to be way bigger. Let me use a pen here. It's going to be bigger in comparison to the chloride. That means if this bromide is attached to ammonium, the lattice energy for that is going to be different from the lattice energy of ammonium chloride. However, we know that the enthalpy of solution depends on the difference between the enthalpy of hydration and the lattice enthalpy. There is a possibility that these two could be similar in size depending on how the difference between the two is going to be. So here I say, the halides are bonded to the same cation, but the anions are different in size. Bromide is bigger than chloride, so the hydration enthalpy of bromide is less exothermic than that of chloride. That means that bond is going to be weaker, and as it's formed, less energy is going to be released when ammonium bromide forms in comparison to how much energy is released when ammonium chloride forms. Then I went on to say that also due to the sizes of the halides, the lattice energy of ammonium bromide would be less exothermic than that of ammonium chloride. And my final statement was since enthalpy of solution depends on both the values of lattice energy and hydration energy, they should be similar. Or you could say there is a possibility that they could be similar. It doesn't depend on whether the size of the lattice energy of ammonium bromide is weaker than that of ammonium chloride, what matters is the difference between the two. If the difference between the two is the same in magnitude, I mean comparison, the difference between lattice and hydration for ammonium bromide, if it's the same as the difference between lattice and hydration for ammonium chloride, then the magnitude of the enthalpies of solution can be similar. Moving on here, they say I write an ionic equation to show why aqueous solutions of ammonium chloride are acidic and state symbols are not required. In ammonium chloride, we're going to have ammonium cation and chloride anion. So when it's in solution, the ammonium cation is going to react with water. In this situation, ammonium is going to be an acid reacting with water, donating a proton to the water, and then the water is going to be a base accepting a proton from ammonium, as you can see in this equation here. So ammonium plus water gives us ammonia and the hydroxonium ion. That should be the reaction we're looking for. So this brings us to the end of question 16. Let's continue to question 17. Question 17, this question is about carbonyl compounds. They say three carbonyl compounds, A, B, and C, are straight chain structure isomers with a formula carbon 5, hydrogen 10, oxygen. Only isomer A reacts with Tollens reagent to give a silver mirror. Now, this means isomer A should be an aldehyde. So they're going to say only isomer B reacts with iodine in the presence of alkali to produce pale yellow crystals. This is confirmation that there is either this group here, a CH3, attached to that group, but there is a possibility that it's going to be that attached to OH. However, because they've said these are isomers, and we've confirmed that A is an aldehyde, aldehydes are not isomers with alcohol, so this is going to be out, and that leaves us with a compound that is going to be a ketone. 
So it means there is an R group the other side. So let's continue here. They say draw the displayed structures of these three isomers. We know aldehydes and ketones are isomeric. Therefore, if A was an aldehyde, there is a possibility the other two are going to be ketones. So when they told us to draw the displayed formula, I first drew the aldehyde. Remember, we have five carbons and 10 hydrogens and one oxygen. So that is the possible aldehyde. Now, there is a possibility that it could be a ketone with the carbonyl group being on this part here as the hydrogen switches here. So as we can see in this one here, there is a possibility of formation of a second ketone whereby the carbonyl is on this third carbon, as you can see structure C. So those were the three displayed formally. They're going to say another carbonyl compound propanol reacts with HCN in the presence of KCN to form a resmit mixture of two optical isomers, which are that. So they say give the IUPAC name of this. The base name is going to be one, two, three, four carbon, so that is supposed to be a butane nitrile. However, the CN is supposed to be given the lower carbon, so naming from this side to this side, this is going to be carbon one, and that is going to be carbon two. On carbon two, I have a side group, which is OH, so I'm going to label the position of OH as two hydroxy. So this is two hydroxy butane nitrile. Next, they say describe how you could distinguish between pure samples of two optical isomers. If you have two pure samples of optical isomers, then you're going to expose them to plane polarized light. We would expect one isomer to rotate plane polarized light in one direction, while the other isomer rotates that same plane polarized light in the opposite direction. That is how we would distinguish them. Explain with reference to the reaction mechanism why this reaction produces a resmic mixture. To understand this fully, I need to draw the carbonyl carbon in propanol. It is going to be like that. There is an H here. And there is another carbon so when a nucleophile is attacking it's going to come from either side of the carbonyl carbon so when that occurs we can produce two different products that can be in antiomers and in equal concentrations so here i say the carbonyl carbon of propanol is planar so the nucleophile cn will attack the carbon from either side producing an equimolar mixture of n antiomers moving down here they say Propanol, an isomer of propanol, also reacts with HCN in the presence of KCN. Draw the skeletal formula of the product of this reaction. Here, I began by drawing this structure here, which is the product form. However, I wanted to translate that into a skeletal formula. So to do that, I had to show the different carbons that are present as well as the other atoms. So I began with this methyl group, which is that. Also the other CH3, which is that. Then we have the central carbon, which is there. And then OH on the other side. And the CN here or I could have done it there is a hidden carbon here and then the N then there is a carbon here a carbon there a carbon there and then the OH on the other side so down here they say state why the product formed in C1 does not show optical isomerism it does not show optical isomerism because there is no chiral carbon you can look at this product here this and that are the same therefore this cannot be an optical isomer moving on here they say Carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy provides information about the structures of propanol and propanol. Identify the chemical shift range and carbon environments of one peak you would expect to see in both spectra. Since both are carbonyl compounds, I'll expect the carbon-oxygen double bond peak, and it's going to be evident in this range. Lastly, they say that the number of peaks you would expect to see in each carbon-13 NMR spectra. Again, I drew for you here propanol and propanol. Propanol, you can see, since this carbon, that carbon, and that carbon are different, so I would expect to find three peaks. But for propanol, that carbon and that carbon are identical, or this methyl and that methyl are identical. So here we would expect that to be one peak, and then the second carbon to be another peak. So this would have two peaks. This brings us to the end of question 17. Let's continue to question 18. Question 18. Compare and contrast the reactions of ethanol chloride with water, with ethanol, and with ammonia. Refer to the structural features of the molecules that determine the type of reaction. Identify the products of the reactions. You may include equations in your answer. I began by looking at the similarities since all the other molecules are reacting with ethanol chloride, which has a chlorine atom. In all reactions, a chlorine atom is going to be lost, and all the reactions are very vigorous. Then, during the reaction mechanisms, a lone pair of electrons attacks the partially positive carbon. Let me show you this one here. You can see because this is going to be the ethanol chloride, we have the carbon oxygen double bond and then the chloride on the other side. This is partially positive, that is partially negative, and then the electrons are going to be donated to this one. So that is what it meant. 
And then the difference is the reactions involve production of different products. Now for the first one, we can see when it reacts with ammonia, an amide is going to be produced as we can see in this reaction here. And then we see ammonium chloride on the other side. A reaction with water produces ethanoic acid, as we can see here. This plus water produces ethanoic acid and HCl. And then a reaction with ethanol produces an ester. Again, this is the ethanol chloride reacting with ethanol produces an ester and HCl. So those are the similarities as well as the differences in this. And uh, this brings us to the end of question 18, as well as the end to this part two video. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.